Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 86, we're going to take a look at a brand new tube, the 6N 6P, and a prototype preamp that I built so that I could listen to it. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers are going to have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. It's been a while since I introduced a new audio tube. Let's start with the data sheet. I promise you we won't spend long there. Okay, so first off, this is a Soviet era tube. So that means that it's going to be, its descriptor or its designation is going to be written out in Cyrillic. And of course the Russian alphabet is, it looks the same as the Western alphabet, but it's different. The numbers are the same. So six is fine. H is actually RN. Six is fine. This is the symbol for pi. And conventionally, when we translate these, we always make the pi not a pi symbol. We make it just simply a p. Now, there are um, three versions of this tube. There's the standard version, the 6N6P, and there is, look, at, this is a backwards N. That's actually an I. <laughs> so there's a 6N6P-I. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And there's also a computer rated version. We're not gonna we're not interested in the computer tube whatsoever, so let's just forget that thing. <laughs> most computer tubes, most, not all, but most, are not worth worth looking at. They were designed for on and off applications, and they're really not normally not normally good for audio. This is a great data sheet, this series, because they, they give a translation right on the sheet. So Right away, we can see that it's got a 6.3 volt heater. And the current on the heater is, uh, I'm reading upside down here, I think it's, I'm reading 750 milliamps, plus or minus 70. That's actually quite high. Um, in comparison, a typical small twin triode, that's what this is. This is two triodes in one envelope, just like a 6SN7 or a 12AU7 or, you know, Pick, pick your pick your tube. <laughs> There's lots of small twin triodes out there. So in comparison to the E80CC, which is a big sexy tube just like this, it would be about 600 milliamps, I think. And a 12AU7, I think, is roughly 300 milliamps, which is less than half. So this is a fair amount of current, but we'll in a minute we'll discover why there's so much current going to the heater. What else have we got to learn from the data sheet? Ah, minimum and maximums. You know I love those. So the heater can run at a maximum of 7 volts AC or DC and a minimum of 5.7 volts AC or DC. That's quite a nice big range. So that, that means that if you only have a switch mode power supply, let's say powering your heaters, which is what I do, and you can only find a 7 volt or a 6 volt, which is the case, then you can run either one of them without um, worrying about the voltage. You don't need to drop the 7 volts. Plate maximum is 300 volts. The dissipation is 4.8 watts per side. Combined maximum is 8 watts. That's actually quite a bit. This You could run this as a really as a very small power tube. Um, and um, this is the most interesting thing we want to look at. One half of the tube could pass 45 milliamps of current, which is, that's quite a bit. And the two of them, if you're operating both sides, can operate 40 milliamps per side. So that's, if you were to parallel them, that's 80 milliamps. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay, the pinout 
is basically the 6DJ8 pinout. There's a whole series of tubes in that family that are 6 volt heated tubes. So they don't need a center tap on pin 9. In fact, pin 9 in this case is the shield, just like in the 6DJ8 series, and the pinout is identical. Okay. That's boring. Well, let's just finish up. We got one more interesting thing to look up in the data sheets. So, the dash i version, this one here, that is a pulse capable version of this basic tube of the of the base tube, the 6N6P. And a pulse is can be almost anything. It could be a high frequency burst, it could be a high frequency voltage burst. Certain applications are going to need to uh, have a, either a regular cyclical burst. It's outside of my field of expertise. So let's just let's just accept the fact that the tube can take a, a big shot of something. <laughs> you know, a big, big shot of a high frequency um, uh, of a very short duration. A pulse is a very short duration of something. So that version, it draws 900 milliamps, almost a full amp, which that's getting really quite high. And in a minute I'll talk about why we're even looking at the pulse capable tube. And it's got to do with how they sound, of course. Okay, enough with the data sheets. Let's take a look at the tubes. So this is the basic version, the 6N6P. Let me see if I can get it on camera so you can see it. Now, the commonly available version is NEVZ. That's a large Soviet-era collective manufacturer. I don't actually know where the plant was. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a... Let me get my pointer on it. There's the CC... Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Let me get it. There we go. I think I've got it. CCCP. And that is in Cyrillic, but it translates to uh, Soviet Socialist mm, Union of Republics or something like that. Anyways, that's the... In the West, we've always called that the Soviet Union for short, right? And um, the date on these tubes is 1977. Many of my tubes are in the 80s, uh, but I'm getting... I'm getting some in in the 70s, in the 1970s. Let, let's have a look at the physical properties of the tube. So you've got two assemblies, of course, with a shield. Let me just show you that shield. I don't know if we can see. There's pin 9 right there. Can you see the wire coming through and clipping on? It clips right onto the end here of the shield. So the shield is a physical barrier of metal between the sections, and that helps isolate the tube, both tubes from each other, right? Electrically. And if you connect the shield up to ground, that, that enhances that capability. There you can see sort of the shield coming on to, into view. So that's a really great thing. In tubes of that design type, um, you end up with a much better isolation electrically of the two halves of the two triodes. And notice how the plates have sort of like fins or little wings that are open. And you can, if you look closely, you can actually see the grid wire wound around the cathode, which of course goes around the heater filament, right? One of these days when we're really bored, we're going to break apart one of these big tubes and look at it. But you can see exploded. You can go online and look at, you know, an exploded diagram of a tube. Um, it's no different in reality. They're exactly the same. So that's showing us that this plate is designed to take current, right? Because it's designed to dissipate heat. You put current through a tube, you get heat, and you've got to get rid of it. So that's why it's designed that way. We've got a single mic on top. A very typical Soviet-era saucer getter, they're called. This one's on one stock. Some of them are on two stocks. And you, you've got a really large chrome dome in a, what I think is a sexy package. You know, a nice, tall, nine-pin package. This is your standard miniature nine-pin, just like a 12AU7, 12AX7. Okay. 
And let's take a look at these. These are the pulse rated, the dash I version. They came new um, in the sleeve, which is actually something new for me. I've never actually seen this style of sleeve. They're really quite neat. Um, and they were bulk packed, so 100 to a case. And you see how they just, they nestle on the fold? It's really a great design. For bulk packing, that's the way to go. And let me see if I can get it up on camera so you can see. There's your dash backwards end, that's the dash I. And these are dated 8701. Physically, they look exactly the same, don't they? Well, they're actually slightly shorter. See, there's just a little bit of a difference in height. Okay, now let's just take a really quick look at the schematic that I built or designed. Let's get those out of here carefully. Okay, now you might say, Jim, you've got, let me back out just a tiny bit. You've got two wonderful kit preamps, and I do. And Everyone who's built them really likes them. And in fact, I haven't had a negative comment yet. And I love them both. They both sound great. That's the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 and the E80CC. But if you want to know how a triode sounds, one of the best things you can do is to put it into a prototype preamp circuit because that's where you can really hear a difference in a tube. So if later on we decide to use the 6N6P as, let's say, a driver tube, with that current capability, it probably would be a fabulous driver tube in certain applications. But as I found out, it's also an absolutely excellent sounding preamp tube. So we're not going to spend long on the circuit, but it's basically the, a standard preamp topology that take, makes use of the two halves of the twin triode for one channel, right? So we have stage one is the voltage gain stage. You can see how our signal inverts and the signal gets larger. Then we couple through a capacitor and we take the signal off the cathode. So we lose a tiny little bit of of gain, not much. It's roughly, what was it? 10%? 3%? I forget. It's less than 10%. Um, we lose a little bit of gain, but we get a very low impedance, which means that we can drive virtually anything. Long cable runs, uh, the next stage very easily. And here we have what looks like a slightly complicated cathode bias arrangement. So, if you look at R6, you'll see that we've got our, our cathode resistor. Here I've just marked 816R. That's just because I didn't have a 720. So I use the 816. 720s are on the way in, but the difference in bias is going to be fairly minor. So, if you decide you want to build a circuit for yourself, go ahead and build a 720 if you've got it. <clears throat> so... Here we've got a really high value, one meg. That is a grid bleed resistor. This sets the bias of the cathode stage. And have a look at here. This is the plate resistor for the gain stage. Look where it ended up. The 12K is down here. So this, between the cathode bias resistor and this inverted plate resistor, that sets the operating point of this tube. Neat, huh? And this tube needs this particular cathode arrangement to function properly. And the, the pulse rated version needs to have roughly 100 volts negative on the grid. So how do we get 100 volts negative on the grid? Well, its grid voltage is relative to cathode voltage, right? In fact, any electrical circuit, the relative difference is the 
very important thing. So we're mostly used to the fact that ground is our reference zero, right? So if we take, let's say, the plate voltage of the gain stage, it's 140 volts. That's reference to, you got it, to ground. Okay, so that's how we get the difference, right? Zero <clears throat> minus 140 is 140. Now over here, if we take a look at this, if we have zero volts on the grid, and we do, right? The signal is AC. We're talking about DC. The circuit runs DC. So if we have zero volts here, and we have 96.7, let's call it a nominal 100 volts on the, the uh, pin 3 on the cathode, then, relatively speaking, the grid voltage is minus 100. Okay, everybody got it. And if you subtract the voltage on either side of this resistor, you actually get roughly 6 volts, let's say. And look at over here. You see how this is biased at 5.2? Well, that's the bias voltage. Okay. Now, that is was that boring? It was boring. But I've got an actual prototype. So let's dig it out. Let's keep this show I'm moving along. Now, we're not going to do a full review of the tube. I've got um, some parts coming in, and we've got to do a full sweep still of the prototype just to make sure there's nothing hiding in the circuit that we can't hear. I'll talk about the listening test in brief in just a minute. So this is my standard topology or design for preamps. It's a dual mono design. One channel is the left channel, one, one tube is the left channel, one tube is the right channel. Can you tell I'm excited? I really am excited about this tube. You've seen this before. Because we've got essentially two power supplies, one for the left and one for the right, we've got two power supply boards. And over here, you might think, I've been doing some MacGyvering. Let me just zoom in a little bit. Now, I like to use our existing circuit boards for prototyping if I can, but because the cathode circuit was beyond the design of this board and it's a little bit more complicated, I couldn't put the resistors in place. So this is, this is actually, let me grab the schematic. This is these three resistors in here that are so critical to getting this tube working properly, uh, especially the pulse version, are right here, one, two, and three. And the reason why they're connected up here is because that was the only way to make the circuit work properly and build on this board. Electrically, it's going to work perfectly. Visually, it leaves a little bit to be desired, but it's enough to get me to a prototype stage so I can listen to the tubes. And Charles is going to, of course, design us a new board, and he'll get all this incorporated into the new board. Will this become a, a new prototype for production? Possibly. It, it, it'll depend on what people have to say. I will say that the tube was a surprise. Now, I built the prototype so that I could hear what the tube sounded like because we were really thinking this would be a great tube for a driver stage at, in some future kit design. And, and I think it will be. I think it will be. But in listening to it in the preamp, I was surprised by the amount of detail. The tube is detailed. In particular, the pulse version. Now, to get a pulse rated tube, you probably have to reinforce the cathode design. So it's probably thicker, probably has a heavier coating. And in many cases, when they do that, they do that for computer tubes, for example. In many cases, those tubes don't sound very good. Well, in this case, the pulse version sounded really good. Um, in fact, the base version sounds really good. So it excels at detail, but it punches. And 
that excites me because if you want your music to sound a little bit live, you need it to come popping off of the, uh, you need that circuit to, to really, I don't know how to say it in English. Um, I wish I had another language. Maybe that would help. The music just pops. It just, it sizzles. <laughs> it's not, it's not cooking like, um, you know, uh, putting your foot in a fire or something like that. That's not what I mean by sizzle. I just mean the music sounds alive. Um, now all of, all of my equipment, that's one of the things that I really strive for. I want my equipment to sound, I want those kits to sound, I want them to sound great, but I want that then to be musical. I want you to sit down and think, wow, this sounds great. And then before you know it, you know, an hour has gone by, two hours. You're turning up the volume. It just sounds so good. You're trying tracks that you haven't listened to for years. And you're like, wow, that actually sounds good in this system. That's what I'm aiming for. Okay. Well, enough of looking at, the, this is the first pass on the 6N6P. We'll come back once we get some sweeps going and have some hard data. We'll look at that. I've got some parts coming in so that I can do some more listening tests. I've got some more tubes coming in and we'll go deeper on this tube. And if anybody else is getting excited about it and thinks maybe that's a preamp they would like in the lineup, let me know and we'll start working towards getting test builders going. But right now um, we're focusing on getting some higher powered um, monoblocks out and um, and a couple of phono preamps designed. Anyways, let's get this off here. So talking about kits, Charles has been busy getting our CNC up and running and he's He's literally, as I speak now, he's a day hopefully away from starting a production run. I'm going to make a production run of top plates for all three of our standard current kits, the EADCC Pre, the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 Pre, and the, um, the URI Monoblocks. And he's going to, he's going to make, um, he's going to make prototype plates for two phono preamps that are in development and he's going to make prototype plates for um, I'm going to keep it quiet right now but a higher powered um, at least one higher powered monoblock maybe two and we'll you know as those as we develop those kits you'll see them come up okay so Lots of parts have been coming in, and I don't always show you parts because, well, frankly, it's boring. <laughs> and um, but we've got a, we also have a headphone uh, amplifier that's in development, and it takes a lot of parts because it's essentially a stereo integrated amplifier, right? So there's there's two channels in there. There's a there's a preamplifier in there. There's a power amp. So. There's a lot of parts, and um, and I wanted a nice switch because with headphone amplifiers, you need to be able to switch between output impedances for various types of headphones. And in our case, we're going to have four taps, so four uh, four choices of impedance, which is a, I think a good balance between you know cost and um, selection. And we need a good quality switch. And I brought in a whole bunch of switches. And this is actually my favorite. Very low resistance. It's a little bit bigger bodied than what I would like. But I'd like to physically see my switches. Let me get this thing. Let me get, just hang on. <laughs> it takes a little bit to make these things move. So let me just tighten that on. See if you can see it. It's tough to hold. There we go. So it's got really nice positive action. And I've checked uh, some samples for continuity and it's perfect. It has no resistance. I like this kind of switch because, you know, five, ten years down the road, if there's a little bit of resistance in the circuit, a tiny little bit of corrosion, these are tinned over brass, which is really great because uh, a tinning will hold up really well.
But if there is a little bit, you can easily just open up your unit and come in here and put a little contact cleaner on. And Bob's your uncle. Closed units are smaller and perhaps will last longer before they start to develop any issues with corrosion. Surface corrosion is what we're talking about. But they're sealed. And in most cases, a sealed switch, once it's done, it's done. So you got to replace it. Okay. What came in for tubes? Well, it's been fairly slow. But some fabulous tubes came in. This is one of my favorite EL34s. And if you see those bumps, you know we're talking about the RFT. And almost all of the production that I see, or anybody sees in the West, is rebranded. In this case, National Electronics. But at the bottom, they actually labeled it correctly, and they say, made in East Germany. And these look very close to new old stock, if not new old stock. You want to know, take a look at the pins and the overall condition. Well, I'll have to test them, but any RFT looking in this good condition is almost certainly new old stock, and I'm sure they're going to test good. So there'll be some more, um, there are more sets for the uh, Wilsonton R8. That's where the high demand is for EL34s, and as soon as I fill those sets, they sell. So if you've been waiting for an R8, full set of tubes based on the RFT. Um, wait no more, there'll be, um, hopefully there'll be some sets in the store this weekend. Okay, look at this box. Siemens EL34. Now years ago Siemens made their own EL34, but they stopped producing, I don't know what year, but it was a long time ago. I think I maybe have only seen one real Siemens tube. So can we guess what this is? Well, it's got an XF2 code. So this is a Mullard, a real Mullard, from the 1960s and early, early 70s, EL34. One of the best EL34s ever made. And this is looking very much new old stock as well, new in the box. And with vintage Mullards, you've got to look for a few things. Yes, look, for the, look at your pins. Look at your base to see if there's any evidence that it's been used. Now, there may be a scratch or two because over the years, more than one person may have tested them. So they might have been tested at the factory and a couple of more owners tested them over the years. So that's acceptable. But the chrome dome really is the big indicator as to the condition of the tube. Sure, we need the testing numbers, but... Again, an EL34 in this shape from a good manufacturer like Mullard almost certainly will test good. This is the single large halo getter version, and it's got a large full chrome dome. I have decided that I prefer the large halo getter, not because they sound necessarily better than the twin halo getters. I don't have one handy or I'd show it to you. Um, but because the vacuum seems to have been better maintained in the large halo getter version. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense at all. Unless something was going on with their vacuum equipment. And that's why they ended up putting two halo getters in. And that's why the vacuum is not nearly as well maintained with those versions. Now, I've never had one of the tubes actually fail a vacuum. So maybe it's a non-issue. Maybe it's just a visual thing I'm seeing. I don't know. I can't figure it out. The double halo getters were made in the same in the same years as the single halo getters. So I think the only thing that makes sense is it just simply was a different line. Uh, but anyways, maybe somebody will jump in and knows the answer to that question that's been nagging. <laughs> it's been nagging me for a long time now. Anyways, there'll be there's there are some quads um, in the store of the Mullard EL34s. They, over the last two months, during what I'm calling the, the great tube shortage and buyout, <laughs> or buy up, uh, I sold almost all of my Mullard inventory. And I had a huge Mullard inventory. Uh, and I've been slowly replacing it. And um, there, are, there are still some lovely quads left, thank goodness. Um, I don't ever want to be, be out of Mullard quads because it's, they're, you know, these are, these two 
And if I could find the Svetlana, I'd say those, if I had a Svetlana quad to show you, I'd say those three types of EL34 are, in my opinion, the best EL34s ever made. Okay, well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after your discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.